Hello everyone, this is Cora Goldston from the WWC webinar team. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you have a moment, please uh, find the chat box option in your toolbar um, and go ahead and introduce yourself um, to the group. Um, and we look forward to starting the webinar in about four or five minutes. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Cora Goldston and I'm with the WWC webinar team. And thank you so much for joining the Missing Data webinar. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Um, in the meantime, if you haven't already, please find the chat box and go ahead and introduce yourself to the group. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask those in the chat box as well. Um, we should be getting started in just a couple of mo moments. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Sarah Caverly with the American Institute for Research, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on missing data with the What Works Clearinghouse or the WWC. Today's webinar will highlight the guidelines for reviewing analyses with missing or imputed data under the WWC standards version 4.0. And we have two great presenters, Dr. Jessica Sparbrook and Dr. David Miller, who will share their expertise and answer your questions. On today's webinar, we will discuss how missing data can lead to bias under different scenarios, present an overview of the updates in the WWC standards version 4.0 for reviewing studies with missing or imputed data. Dr. Spybrook will share information about acceptable methods for addressing missing data under the version 4.0 standards, and Dr. Miller will present strategies for assessing potential bias from missing or imputed outcome data and calculating baseline equivalents in studies with missing or imputed data. Throughout the webinar, you can share your questions with the presenters in the chat box, and we'll have time at the end for Q&A to address some of those questions. All right, before we get started, we wanted to share the goals for this webinar. 
We hope that you leave today with useful takeaways and a better understanding of missing data under version 4.0 standards. During the webinar, we'll identify methods the WWC considers acceptable for addressing missing data and group design studies. I will also cover the assessment of potential bias due to missing or imputed outcome data and assessing baseline equivalence in the presence of missing or imputed data. Please note that we are not presenting every possible missing data scenario or mathematical formula. However, we will share resources and their locations as we move through the webinar. With that, I'll turn the webinar over to our first presenter, Dr. Spybrook, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And let me add my welcome to those of you on the webinar. I'm going to begin by helping us think a bit about why missing data is important and some of the ways that missing data can occur in studies. So I think we would all agree that missing data is quite common in research studies, and I'm going to present three scenarios that occur frequently in practice and all lead to missing data. So let's begin with scenario one. So imagine that we have a randomized trial and we obtain baseline measures for all students and then we implement our intervention. Go back to collect the outcome data. Some students have moved, they're absent, or for whatever reason, we are not able to collect outcome data for all the students we had in our sample at baseline. So in this case, we have complete baseline data, but are missing outcome data. I'm sure this sounds quite familiar as this is a very common case of attrition. In scenario two, imagine a study in which we have the opposite case. That is, we have outcome data for a sample of students, but we do not have baseline data for every student. So this might occur in a quasi-experimental design where we are retrospectively gathering baseline data for a set of students with outcome data. The final scenario represents a study in which there is missing data at both baseline and or outcome. For example, we have some students in which we collected baseline data, but not outcome data. We have some students in which we collected outcome data, but not baseline data. And some students in which we have complete data or data at both baseline and outcome. This is also quite common in practice. So the challenge presented by all of these scenarios is that missing data can introduce bias and create other analytic issues if participants with missing data systematically differ from those with observed data. So perhaps a good example of a case in which missing data could potentially introduce bias is to think about the case of a high school intervention study. So suppose we collect baseline data for a sample of 11th grade students at the beginning of the year. At the end of the year, we go back to collect outcome data. And at that time, we discover many of the students we collected baseline data are no longer at the school. So perhaps it may be the case that these students have dropped out. So if the students who dropped out are systematically different from those students who did not drop out, we could be introducing bias. We can also think of a case in which missing data creates other analytic issues. So perhaps one of the most common cases is in QEDs and high attrition RCTs. Both of these types of studies need to establish baseline equivalence of the intervention and comparison groups. And missing data, missing baseline data can create challenges for assessing this baseline equivalence. So in an effort to keep up with current literature on best practices for handling missing data, the WWC made some updates to the standards around missing data from version three to version four. So we're gonna review those changes. Under 3.0, only low attrition RCTs can impute missing data and be eligible to meet WWC group design standards. Under 4.0, all eligible group design studies can impute missing data and be eligible to meet WWC group design standards under certain circumstances. Under 3.0, studies must use an acceptable approach to address all missing data in the analytic sample. Under 4.0, this is still the case. However, dummy imputation has been added to the list and there is also additional guidance provided for the acceptable approaches. 
Under 3.0, studies can satisfy the baseline equivalence only by using non-imputed data for the entire analytic sample. Under 4.0, the standard is relaxed such that studies can satisfy baseline equivalence using data on a subset of the analytic sample or imputed data for the analytic sample. So for the remainder of this webinar, we are gonna focus on breaking down the steps that need to be taken to review a study with missing or imputed data that are outlined in the 4.0 standards handbook. However, before we get into the nitty gritty of these actual steps, we want you to keep in mind that these steps are really trying to help us answer three key questions when reviewing a study with missing or imputed data. And those three questions are as follows. So the first question is, is the approach for addressing missing data acceptable? The second driving question is, is bias due to missing or imputed outcome data limited? And the third question is, are the intervention and comparison groups comparable, accounting for missing or imputed baseline data? So the actual steps in the 4.0 standards handbook are gonna help us answer these three overarching questions. So now we're going to start to get into these nitty gritty details of the steps. I'm sure this figure looks quite familiar to folks as this is the flow chart that's provided in the 4.0 standards handbook. Starts on page eight and we're gonna, the flow chart continues on page nine. And we're gonna kind of, um, go through this rather quickly because in the remainder of the webinar, we're actually gonna break down each of these steps. So we are going to begin with step one, which asks us if the method for addressing missing data is acceptable. The standard handbook provides a list of five acceptable methods for addressing missing data. Please note that in this slide, I'm just giving a brief description of each method. There are conditions under e which each method is acceptable and additional requirements for some of the methods. We're gonna highlight these conditions and requirements after we review the methods. And for more detail, they're also described in table 2.6 in the standards handbook. So the first method is complete case analysis, or the case in which the study only analyzes observations for which all data are not missing. Note that in this case, we would not need to apply the procedures for reviewing studies with missing data because there is no missing data here. The second method is a form of regression imputation in which a regression model is used to predict imputed values for missing data. This could be a single regression model or involve the use of multiple imputation. The third method is dummy imputation. In this case, we replace the missing values with a constant. So for example, the mean for non-missing observations and include a missing data indicator in the impact model. Please note that mean imputation without an indicator variable is never acceptable under 4.0. The fourth method is maximum likelihood. And in this method, we use an iterative routine to estimate model parameters while appropriately accounting for missing data. And the fifth method is the use of non-response weights. In this case, data are weighted based on estimated probabilities of having a non-missing outcome. Higher weights are given to participants with a higher probability of having missing outcome data. So these are the five methods that are described in the 4.0 standards, but it is also important to note that the WWC may consider other methods acceptable if they're supported by a citation to a peer-reviewed journal article or textbook. And in these cases, the review team leadership will be consulted. So as I just mentioned, there are conditions under which the approaches are acceptable as well as additional requirements in some cases. So the goal of this table is to help identify the conditions under which an approach is acceptable and to note when additional requirements are present. So let's break this table down. In the first column, we list each of the five methods. 
The next three columns identify the conditions under which a method is acceptable. And specifically, the study designs for which a method is acceptable and whether it can be used to include participants with missing baseline and or outcome data. The final column identifies the methods which have additional requirements. So let's take a closer look at each of these methods. In row one, we have complete case analysis. So from this table, we can see this is an acceptable method for all study designs, but cannot be used to include participants with missing baseline and or outcome data. This makes sense given that we just said that complete case method only uses participants with complete baseline and outcome data. In row two, we have regression imputation. So from the table, we can see again that this method is acceptable for all study designs and can be used to include participants with missing baseline and or outcome data. Further, this particular method has three additional requirements, which we're going to discuss later. In row three, we have dummy imputation. So dummy imputation in terms of the study design is only acceptable for non-compromised RCTs. Further, it can be used to include participants with missing baseline data only. Please note one exception, important exception to this, is that for QEDs and for compromised RCTs, dummy imputation can be applied to baseline measures that are not specified in the review protocol as required to assess baseline equivalence. The fourth method that we have is maximum likelihood. This method, again, is acceptable for all study designs and can be used to include participants with missing baseline and or outcome data. Note that the procedure must use a standard statistical package or include relevant citations. In the final row, we have non-response weights. This method is acceptable for all study designs, but only for missing outcome data. There are also two additional requirements which are described in more detail in Table 2.6 of the handbook. So the purpose in putting this table together is really to hopefully provide a resource for folks to help them answer the question step one, about whether the study uses an acceptable approach to address all missing data in the analytic sample. In the next few slides, I'm gonna demonstrate how we would use this table to help us answer step one. So before we tackle this example, we really want to thank Andrew J. Sue and his, co his collaborators for their willingness to share their study and for sharing additional information with us related to their study. Hopefully everyone was able to access and take a look at the study ahead of time, but by way of review, our example is based on the article entitled Assessing Impacts of Math in Focus, a Singapore Math Program. This study evaluated a core math program, Math in Focus, which is used in over 400 districts in the U.S. The study used a cluster randomized trial in which 22 grade level teams were assigned to receive the program or business as usual. In this webinar, we focus on the main outcome variable that was reported, the SAT-10, which was measured before and after the information, intervention. Sorry. There was missing baseline and outcome data in the study, and the article reported three approaches for handling the missing data. For each approach, we begin by answering step one. Does the study use an acceptable approach to address all missing data in the analytic sample? The first approach described in the study was complete case analysis. So complete case analysis, as we know, is an acceptable approach for all designs, and hence we would move to step two. The second approach described is dummy imputation. I'll give you a second to read that description. 
from that description, we can tell that they use dummy imputation to include participants with missing baseline data. So this is where the table can help you in making your decision. So if we refer back to the table, we can go to the row for dummy imputation, and we can see that dummy imputation is acceptable for non-compromised RCTs and for missing baseline data. Since this study is a non-compromised RCT and the method is only applied to missing baseline data, the approach is acceptable and the review would proceed to step two. The third approach is multiple imputation. From the description, it appears that multiple imputation will use to include participants with missing baseline and or outcome data. So again, we can go back to the table to assess the appropriateness of this approach. So from the regression imputation row, we can see that the method is acceptable for all study designs and for missing baseline and or outcome data. So as such, the conditions are met in this study. However, there are also three additional requirements to determine if the approach is acceptable. The three additional requirements include, A, the study was, or I'm sorry, the imputation regression model was conducted separately by condition or included an indicator variable for condition. B, included all covariates used for adjustment in the impact model and C, included the outcome when imputing missing data. We conducted an author query and the author shared that the imputation model did not include the outcome when missing baseline data, hence it does not meet these three requirements. So let's review the potential ratings after step one. Recall that if the study does not use an acceptable approach to address all missing data in the analytic sample, then it receives the does not meet WWC group design standards rating. In our example, this applies to the multiple imputation analyses. The review continues if the study uses an acceptable method for addressing missing data. In our example, the complete case analysis and dummy imputation approaches would then proceed to step two. So let's take a pause here and do a quick knowledge check to be sure that we are all on the same page with regards to step one. I'm going to give you a minute to, or a couple minutes to read through these, and you're also going to see a poll appear on your screen where we ask you to log your response. So please note that if the poll is blocking the text on your slides, like it does to mine right now, you can just move the poll box over with your own mouse. We'll give folks about one more minute. Looks like a third of you have provided your votes already, so keep putting in those votes if you can. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ooh, we're up to 50% at this point. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at our responses here. It looks like we had over 50% of the people log in, and it looks like we have quite a bit of agreement, too, in terms of our poll results here. So uh, given the, the pretty high levels of agreement, let's go ahead um, and flip right to our next slide, David, please. Okay, so we do have the table in there because again, as I mentioned before, the table is something that could very well be used to help you go through these different scenarios. Um, in this case, as most people noted, C is the correct answer here. Mean imputation must include a dummy variable to indicate missingness. So on its own, mean imputation is not going to meet standards. So just to highlight um, the other responses. So in A, we had a high attrition RCT that uses an acceptable method of impu imputation. So unless there are other design issues here, the study would have the potential to meet WWC group design standards with reservations. For B, we have a QED, which uses dummy imputation to account for missing data and measures that the review protocol does not require for assessing baseline equivalence. And as we noted on the table, or I'm sorry, in, in the table and in the definitions, that actually is acceptable since these are not required under the protocol. So like before, this study would have the potential to meet standards with reservations. In D, we had a compromised RCT. So it looks like there were a few questions coming in about a compromise, what a compromised RCT is. So an example of a compromised RCT would be one that includes subjects in the sample used to estimate the findings, so in the analytic sample, who were not randomly assigned, so a type of broken random assignment in essence. So in this case, D was a compromised RCT that uses maximum likelihood to analyze a sample with missing baseline and outcome data, which is perfectly acceptable for maximum likelihood. So unless there were other design issues, this study would also have the potential to meet with reservations. So at this point, I am going to turn things over to David, who is going to walk us through the next steps in the review process. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to share with you the next two steps, which are all addressing the driving question, is bias due to missing or imputed outcome data limited? And so this starts with step two, which is, is the study a low attrition RCT? If it is, no further review about missing or imputed data are needed. In that case, it's eligible for the highest rating meet WWC group design standards without reservation if the method for addressing missing data is acceptable as we determined or not in step one, and if there are no other issues such as confounds or measurement issues that would reduce the rating. The rationale behind this is that if attrition is low, we're saying that the amount of missing or imputed outcome data is so small that it does not pose a considerable threat of bias. And furthermore, due to random assignment, 
the groups are considered equivalent at baseline because of the randomization process, which is why this study meets the standards without reservations, even though we do not need to assess baseline equivalence for this type of study. One important note is that when assessing attrition, imputed outcome data do count as attrition. The rationale behind that is that both imputed outcome data and missing outcome data can pose a threat of bias, which is why we account that as attrition. So when computing attrition, the denominator is going to be the number of students in the full randomized sample. And the numerator is going to be based on the analytic subsample with observed outcome data. I use the word subsample because in cases in which you impute um, outcome data, not all of the participants in your analytic sample have observed outcome data. And then, if, it's, if the study is a QED, quasi-experimental design, high attrition RCT, or compromised RCT, then review proceeds to the next step, step three. So let's apply this step to the example map and focus study. So as, as a reminder, there were 22 grade level teams were randomly assigned 12 to the intervention condition, 12 to the comparison condition. As a cluster level RCT, there are some additional considerations that have to be taken into account. But setting that aside, the first step in evaluating attrition um, and non-response for cluster level RCTs is to first evaluate cluster level attrition. So we're going to do that first. So there was one intervention team and one comparison team that had no pre-test and no post-test data. And there were two other intervention teams who had no post-test data. So the numbers of teams break down like this. So the top row is the number of clusters in the randomized sample. And then below is the number of clusters for each of the three analyses that were conducted. In all reported analyses, the total attrition, it, the total cluster level attrition, is going to be four divided by 22. Um, the reason is, is because there were four teams that did not have uh, outcome data. And so even though the multiple imputation analyses included two more teams, their outcome data were imputed, which counts as attrition. And we can also assess differential attrition. In this case, it's 15%. When conducting this uh, review step, we use the standard uh, attrition boundaries that are provided in the WD WWC handbook. And even under the optimistic attrition boundary, um, under, even under the optimistic attrition boundary, uh, the attrition is high. So this is a high attrition RCT um, and review proceeds to step three. So, Let's do a knowledge check of this step. The researchers randomly assigned 50 students to an intervention group and 50 to a comparison group. They visited schools one day before, one day after the intervention, and obtained data for the following numbers of students. Their analytic sample included students who had pre-test or post-test data, and they used a regression imputation model meeting WWC standards. So the bottom highlighted row, uh, highlighted in orange, is the number of students in the analytic sample. And then the question is, what is the overall rate of attrition? Okay, I'm gonna launch the polling features again. Uh, it might block 
your um, it might block your view, but you can just move that uh, if that's the case. I'll give you a few few moments. Looks like we're at 46%. I'll give us a few more moments. Okay, so we're at almost at 60%. So I'm going to end the polling and show you the results. So it looks like there wasn't a strong agreement on this particular question, which is great for me because then this indicates to me that there's important content uh, to address here in evaluating step three. So uh, no one said 6%. Um, but we were mixed between 10 and 10% uh, and 21%. So I'm going to stop sharing and then move on. So what I want to point out here, so the orange is the analytic sample. As a reminder for step three, it's just the imputed outcome data that count as attrition. Imputed baseline data do not count as attrition um, if, if those um, uh, subjects are included in the analysis. It's just the imputed outcome data. So the relevant sample to consider here is the sample that had post-test data, which is the analytic subsample that had observed, meaning non-imputed outcome data. So the correct answer here, which is actually the only the, the third most common answer in this case, is 15%. And so walking through that, you know, the difference between the randomized sample and the analytic subsample that has observed outcome data should be used to compute attrition. And so in this case, the full randomized sample is 100 students. 85 students had observed outcome data, that's 45 plus 40, as shown in the highlighted blue box. And so the difference between those is 15 students. 15 students in the analytic sample did not have observed outcome data, and therefore overall attrition is 15%. Seems like some uh, that there other common answers were 10% and 21%. 10% just corresponds to if we use the, um, the orange sample to compute attrition. But again, that doesn't, in, you know, we have to account the, uh, this, the subjects with imputed outcome data as attrition in that orange sample. But it's not quite as bad as, um, as if we had to base attrition calculations on the had pretest and post-test data because again, it's only the imputed outcome data that count as attrition. So to help walk you through these steps, the online study review guide on the WWC website will help you along every step along the way. So here's the link to that. This review guide is used both in commissioned 
WWC reviews, but there's also a public version that anyone with computer access can go in and use for an example study, including their own study if you're a researcher. And so where steps one and two are addressed on this online study review guide is after entering an outcome measure. You'll see something like this. And where step one is asked, you'll see that there, there's a place for that that asks, does the study use an acceptable approach to address all missing data in the analytics, analytic sample? So you just have to use the information that Jessica presented to correctly uh, answer that question. But then step two, you just enter in the requested information below here. So the numbers that I've entered in here actually correspond to the numbers in the previous knowledge check. So you can see that there's a place where it also asks for the number of subjects with observed outcome data. So you would input that in. And then the online study review guide automatically applies these steps. So you don't have to do that yourself, but we do feel it's important to have a conceptual understanding of what the online uh, study review guide is doing behind the scenes. But again, it, this will help you along every step along the way. So moving on to step three, this is asking, does the study limit potential bias from imputed outcome data? if any outcome data are imputed. So impact estimates may be biased if missing values depend on unmeasured factors. And the WWC requires the bias due to imputed outcome data, the potential bias due to imputed outcome data, to be less than 0.05 standard deviation. Now, there's obviously a challenge here, right? Is that we want to know the, the bias due to uh, imputed outcome data, but the reason that it's imputed is because the values were not directly observed. So what do we do in that case to uh, assess potential bias? Well, the general approach is to use observed data from other measures to bound the bias due to imputation. So for this specific step, we're actually gonna use the observed baseline data to, to bound the potential imputed outcome bias. For a later step, what we'll do is we'll use the observed outcome data to bound the potential baseline difference. But the idea is the same. We're using information that we know and making a reasonable set of assumptions to say uh, what, is a, what is a range of possible uh, biases that these imputation methods could introduce. The correlation between the baseline and outcome measure is critical. The basic idea here is that the higher correlation that you have, the better of an imputation you have and the more the potential bias is limited. Conversely, we can think about this in the opposite way. What about the case in which the correlation between the baseline and the outcome measure is zero? What that essentially means is that knowing something about the baseline measure tells you nothing at all about the outcome measure. So in that case, um, you know, we can't really use the baseline measure to bound the bias in imputed outcome data. So one study design uh, consideration for researchers is to use baseline measures that are reliable and cor correlate strongly with the outcomes that you're hoping to collect. That's a, a point that's good to follow in general, but it also applies here in terms of thinking about uh, limiting bias from imputed outcome data. I'm not gonna go into the mathematical, the derivations of the mathematical formulas that are used in this step, but I will note that they were adapted from methodological work on item level survey non-response. I've provided a citation here in case you want to look into that further, 
Furthermore, the appendices, appendices B and C of the WWC uh, 4.0 handbook provides mathematical derivations for the formulas that are used for this step. So I'm first going to talk about just what is the information that we need to know in order to complete this step, and then I'll talk about what we will do with that information. So to answer if potential bias from imputed outcome data is limited, we have to know the following information about the baseline measure. So, um, and it's important to note that the baseline measure should be the one that's specified in the review protocol as necessary for assessing baseline equivalence. So let's first focus on the simple scenario in which the analytic sample had no missing baseline data, but did have imputed outcome data. So in that case, a graphical representation of this scenario would look like this. We have complete baseline data, but not observed outcome data for all participants. Um, but the highlighted blue parts are the analytic sample. So from this sample, what we need to know about the baseline measure is the descriptive statistics, the mean, the standard deviations, and the sample sizes separately by condition for that baseline measure. And then the reason why we need to know the standard deviations and sample sizes is that we have to be able to compute a pooled within group standard deviation, which I'll call S sub X. And then we need to know the following information about the complete case sample. That is the uh, participants that have observed outcome data and observed baseline data. We need to know the baseline means for the sample separately by condition. In addition, we also must know the baseline outcome correlation. So this can be estimated based on a complete case sample or also an outside study if a content expert judges the settings to be similar. But very importantly, this correlation must not be estimated using imputed data. It has to be based on observed data for both observed baseline and observed outcome data. Okay. And where you would enter in this information in the online study review guide is it would be entered in after entering a baseline measure. And it would look something like this. So it asks subjects used to assess baseline equivalence, subjects with observed baseline and outcome data, subjects with observed baseline data. Um, and uh, this is for the simple scenario in which we have no missing baseline data. Uh, in the analytic sample, but if there are mis uh, baseline data that are missing or imputed, additional boxes will appear below asking for more information. And a slightly different set of formulas will be used uh, to assess this more complex scenario, but the information required is not substantially uh, different if you also have some missing or imputed baseline data. Now, what I'm going to do is present some example formulas to help demystify what is going on in this step. Again, the online study review guide will automatically apply these formulas, but I do think it is important to understand the basic approach and have a basic un conceptual understanding of, of the formulas. So I've included the uh, graphical representations and symbols that I've included below. The symbols that I have here correspond to the same terminology that's used in the WWC appendices, and it's going to correspond to the terminology um, that's used in the formulas that I'll show you. So again, in the simple scenario in which there's complete baseline data, the following three conditions must be met. So what I'm gonna show you is three different mathematical formulas that correspond to um, different bounds 
for the potential bias due to imputed outcome data. And in all cases, these three mathematical formulas have to evaluate to be less than 0.05, because again, the WWC requires the, the potential bias due to imputed outcome data to be less than 0.05 standard deviation. So the first formula is this. I'll walk you through each part, uh, each component uh, of this formula. So first, let me highlight this right term here, which is the difference in baseline means for the comparison group um, between the analytic sample on the left side and the complete case sample on the right side. And then we're dividing that by the pooled within group standard deviation. So what does this term represent? Well, it's essentially just a standardized difference in means between the two different samples um, for the comparison group. That's all it is. Then there's a term here that depends upon the baseline outcome correlation row. And the important thing to note here is that this term is smaller for larger correlations. This goes back to the point that I was saying earlier, is that if you have stronger baseline outcome correlations, that's a better uh, imputation, and the more that you can limit, uh, the more you can limit outcome, imputed outcome data uh, bias from that. There's also, a make, there's also an omega term on the left, that's just a small study correction term. For moderate to large samples, this is approximately equal to one. Um, and so it's, it's probably the least important term for you to understand. Okay, so that's the first formula. There's a second formula, which you'll see is essentially the same thing, but instead of the baseline mean, it's the intervention group mean. But otherwise, it's basically the same. And then there's a third formula that's basically a difference in differences, right? It's the difference in the standardized difference in means between, between the comparison and intervention groups, okay? And then this is the formula for the small study correction term. So now what I'm going to show you is a graphical representation of the potential combinations of differences in baseline means that can limit potential uh, bias from imputed outcome data under different Pre uh, under different baseline outcome correlation. So this looks rather complex, but I will walk you through it to help you understand. So the x-axis is the standardized difference in baseline means between those two different samples, uh, the complete case and the, the analytic sample um, for the intervention group. And then the y-axis is basically the same thing, but for the comparison group. And then we have different lines corresponding to different baseline outcome correlations. So let me first focus in, in the innermost one, the gold line. Any point, any combination of standardized differences and baseline means that falls within that boundary will satisfy step three. So as a perhaps extreme example, if there is no difference in baseline means for both the comparison group and intervention group, meaning that the point falls squarely on the origin, then outcome data, uh, potential bias from outcome data, imputed outcome data is considered limited. But if it falls outside of those boundaries, then it would not satisfy step three. And what you can see here is that for larger baseline outcome correlations, the possible range of values that you can have for differences in baseline means is wider. Again, going back to the same point, that for stronger uh, baseline outcome correlations, the more that the potential bias from imputed outcome data is limited. So I know this is a lot of information, 
So let's back up for a second and just consider when do we ap even apply step three? Under what conditions would we need to go through this more uh, complex review process? So I'm going to go back to the example math and focus study. As a reminder, there were three different analytic approaches, complete case analysis, demi imputation, and multiple imputation. And the question is, for the math and focus study, also accounting for the uh, ratings that we got from step one, for which methods do we need to apply? Step three, okay? And so I'm gonna launch the polling feature and give you a few moments to think about this and put in your answer. Okay, so we're at 35%. Hope we can get a few more responses in. Okay, I'm going to end the polling and show you the results. So, it looks like the, the most common answer here is only multiple imputation. And the correct answer is actually none of the methods. I admit this is perhaps a bit of a trick question. I can completely understand why the answer B is a tempting answer, but I will address that. So the reason why none of the, oh, let me stop sharing the results. So the reason why we actually don't need to apply this step to any of the three methods that were described for this specific example is because only multiple imputation involves imputing outcome data, but, and this is where that I, fully admit this might be a bit of a trick question, but it's important to note, is that step three in this case is not required because from step one, we already know that the analysis will receive the does not meet WWC group design standards rating. So there's no point in continuing further this analysis because we know it will not uh, review of this analysis because we know that it will not meet standards. Now, if the imputation model had met WWC standards in step one, then answer uh, B, the most common uh, response, would be correct. And, but it looks like there's also um, some, uh, some people that had chosen uh, dummy imputation and multiple imputation. I can also completely understand why that might be a tempting answer. But it's important to note that for dummy imputation, 
only missing baseline data, but not outcome data, were imputed. So that's why we don't need apply step three, which is focused only on assessing bias from imputed outcome data. That's the reason why step three does not need to be applied to dummy imputation. And then, of course, for complete case analysis, the, in the analytic sample, there is no missing data for a baseline or um, outcome measures because by the very design, we're only analyzing cases that have observed data for both. Okay. So now let's go back to the flow chart that I showed earlier, now that we've addressed all three steps. So again, step one is, does the study use an acceptable approach to address all missing data? And the answer is, and then if the answer is no, as it is for multiple imputation, we do not need to review that analysis any further. But for the Mass and Focus study, we would continue on to step two for uh, the other two analyses. But since the study is a high attrition RCT, we moved on to step three. But for demi imputation and complete case analysis, neither of those approaches involved um, imputing outcome data. So we actually do not need to apply step three to the specific study that we are focusing in on today. So obviously, in other studies, you may need to apply step three. Now, I'm going to present the next two steps, which are primarily focused on considering, is there baseline equivalence accounting for missing or imputed baseline data? Here's a flow chart of these two steps. So step four is, is the study a high attrition RCT that analyzes the full randomized sample using imputed data? If it's not, then we have to move on to step five, which is assessing baseline equivalence. There's a lot of different boxes here, but uh, the reason why that is, is that there's two different steps, uh, step 5A and step 5B, that are applied depending upon the particular scenario at hand, namely whether or not there's missing or imputed baseline data for a baseline measure um, that is needed to assess baseline equivalence. And the basic idea is that if you don't have missing or imputed baseline uh, data for a baseline measure that you need to assess equivalence on, then you can use the standard procedures. But for any particular analysis, you're not going to apply both steps 5A and 5B. It just depends upon the particular scenario at hand. Let's dig into step four, which is, is the study a high attrition RCT that analyzes the full randomized sample using imputed data. So authors can analyze the full randomized sample by impute, imputing all missing baseline data. So one example is if you have 100 students who were randomly assigned, 80 had observed outcome data, and data were imputed for the 20 students with missing outcome data. With the full randomized sample, the groups are assumed to be equivalent at baseline due to randomization. If we analyze the full randomized sample, then we're preserving the integrity of that randomization process. So therefore, in this case, baseline equivalence does not need to be assessed. A high attrition RCT can receive the meets WWC group design standards with reservations rating if the full randomized sample is analyzed. So, but this of course assumes that step one, namely that an acceptable method of imputation was used, and step three, that there's limited bias due to imputed outcome data, have already been met. And the reason why in this case it would receive a with reservations rating is still because it's it's a high attrition RCT, and high levels of R attrition can pose a threat. Um, of, can pose a threat. In the example math and focus study, this step does not apply to any of the analyses because there were randomized students who had both missing baseline 
and missing outcome data, and those students were not included in any analysis. So for instance, two clusters did not contribute, contribute any baseline or outcome data, and they were not included in any of the analyses, which is why step four does not apply to the, uh, the example study. So we would then move on to step uh, five, which is assessing baseline equivalence. We'd apply step 5A, does the study satisfy baseline equivalence for the analytic sample? If there are no participants with missing or imputed data for the measures required by the protocol to satisfy baseline equivalence. In that case, we would use the usual standard WWC procedures to assess baseline equivalence. And if you are, um, have not uh, yet received WWC, uh, certification or know how to do that, there are online training resources for you to learn how to do that. For the math and focus study, this does apply to the complete case analysis. As a reminder, this is not something new to 4.0 standards, but it's an important reminder that baseline equivalence should be assessed for each analytic sample. What that means is, for example, if there's a QED with three outcomes that each had different missingness, then baseline equivalence must be assessed for at least three analytic samples, except if the analyses are restricted to those with complete data for all outcomes. And then we use step 5B instead, if some data are missing or imputed for a baseline measure that the review protocol requires for assessing baseline equivalence. So in step 5B, we have to account for missing or imputed baseline data for a measure that is needed to assess baseline equivalence. The obvious challenge here is that how can we tell if the groups are equivalent if we don't actually know what the baseline values are for all participants in that analytic sample? Well, again, we apply a similar set of a procedures as we did in step three. And the basic idea is that formulas, we use formulas for estimating how large the baseline difference could be based on a set of reasonable assumptions. And we only apply these formulas if data are, are missing or imputed for the baseline measures that the review protocol specifies as necessary for assessing baseline equivalence. Otherwise, we can apply standard procedures, that is step 5A, even if data were missing or imputed for other baseline measures not required for assessing baseline equivalence according to the intervention review protocol. So here's the, this slide will talk about the information that is needed to complete this step. We always must know the baseline outcome correlation because in this case, we're gonna use information about the outcome measure to bound what the potential baseline differences are. And we essentially need to know the same information as we did in step three, but instead this time about the outcome measure. And so let's first focus in on the simple scenario of no missing or imputed outcome data. So graphically, this situation would look like this, where we have complete outcome data for all uh, participants in the analytic sample, but observed baseline data for only some of the participants. We need to know the following information about the outcome measure. We need to know the descriptive statistics, the means, standard deviations, and sample sizes separately by condition for the outcome measure. And then for the complete case sample, that is participants that have both observed baseline and observed outcome data, we need to know just the means for the outcome uh, measure separately by, by condition. We also need to compute the baseline standardized mean difference, but there's flexibility in, in what that difference can be based on. So either it can be based on the imputed sample, as in the left figure, 
That is, we compute a standardized uh, mean baseline difference that's based on both observed and imputed baseline data. Or we can base that standardized mean baseline difference on the complete case sample, on the right figure. Uh, and the basic idea is that separate formulas are used depending on what's reported, but we can handle, uh, the WWC procedures can handle either scenario. But importantly, the standard deviations must be based on the observed baseline sample. The standard deviations cannot be based on imputed data. So I know this is a lot of information, but let me try to weave it all together for the particular study that we have been discussing throughout this study. And let's apply all five steps um, all in the next two slides. So step one, is the method for addressing missing data acceptable? And it is for complete case analysis and demi imputation in this specific study, but it is not for multiple imputation in this specific example because the imputation model did not include the outcome when imputing missing baseline data. Step two, is the study a low attrition RCT? And the answer is no. Attrition is high for all analytic samples in this study. Step three, is potential bias from imputed outcome data limited? We do not actually need to apply this step to any of the analyses for this specific example because no outcome data were imputed for complete case analysis and dummy imputation. Furthermore, it is not necessary for the multiple imputation analyses because we know from step one already that that analysis will not meet WWC standards, so there's no point in reviewing it further. Step four, is the full randomized sample analyzed using imputed data? And the answer is no. Randomized students with neither baseline nor outcome data, um, those, those students that had neither um, baseline nor outcome data were excluded from analysis. So then we move on to step five. Are any baseline data that are needed to assess equivalence missing or imputed? The answer is no for analysis because we're only focusing on participants with observed baseline and observed outcome data for complete case analysis. So we can assess baseline equivalence as we normally would as, as discussed in the uh, online training resources. So the baseline difference is a standardized difference of 0.08 standard deviations according to the reported information in the journal article. The outcome model adjusts for this baseline difference. And so therefore this study is eligible to meet WWC group design standards with reservations. The reason why there's with reservations is because it is a high attrition RCT. Then, are there any baseline data missing or imputed for um, the other analyses? And, it, and there is for dummy imputation. There was imputed baseline data for the dummy imputation analysis. So in that case, we would need to apply step 5B, the more complex review procedures. And in this case, we'd actually have to ask the authors for more information about the outcome measure to assess baseline equivalence using the formulas in the handbook Appendix C. And so one possible outcome of this review is that the highest possible rating is the meets WWC group design standards with reservations rating. But even without sending a, a further author query to gather this additional information, the study is eligible to meet WWC group design standards with reservations because of the complete case analysis. So, this is a lot of information, but again, I want to go back to the online SRG can help you simplify these complex scenarios. So let's consider a, a, perhaps one of the most, most complex scenarios, which is a high attrition RCT that involves imputing both baseline and imputing outcome data. 
but still some randomized participants were not included in analysis. And so therefore, step, slot, step four does not apply, and baseline equivalence still must be assessed. This scenario would actually describe the multiple imputation analyses in the Map and Focus study if the imputation model had satisfied step one. But again, with the online SRG, all you need to do is simply enter in the needed information and the SRG does the rest. It automatically applies the formulas and the review steps needed to assess all these different considerations. So let's end with one last knowledge check. A high attrition RCT assigned 60 students to the intervention group and 60 students to the comparison group. There's outcome data available for 50 in the intervention and 45 students in the comparison group. Baseline data were available for 45 students in the intervention group and 50 students in the comparison group. And the authors imputed missing baseline and missing outcome data using an acceptable approach. And so the analytic sample consisted of uh, 60 intervention students and 60 comparison groups, the full randomized sample. So I'll give you a moment to consider the answers below, and then we'll discuss. Okay, so I'm going to share the results. And it looks like the most common answer was saying that it's eligible to receive the with reservations rating if it both limits bias from imputed outcome data and satisfies baseline equivalence using the largest baseline difference accounting for missing and imputed data. So actually in this case, answer C is the correct answer. Let me stop sharing results so you can see the full screen. And the reason is the study uses an acceptable approach to address missing data in the analytic sample, step one. It is a high attrition RCT, step two. It analyze, but it analyzes the full randomized sample in step four. And so because it, it analyzes the full randomized sample, we do not need to assess baseline equivalence. We only must show that it demonstrates that the potential bias from analyzing imputed outcome data is limited. So let me discuss answer B though, because it was a common answer. So a high attrition RCT that analyzes the full randomized sample using imputed data does not need to satisfy baseline equivalence. Um, and so it's um, to be eligible to meet that WWC 
uh, group design standards with reservation rating. And so it was only in the case of the map and focus study that step four did not apply because none of the analyses analyzed the full randomized sample. But in this case, the full randomized sample was, was analyzed. So that brings us in into the quen uh, question and answers portion, and I'll hand it off to Sarah. Sarah, if you're speaking, we can't currently hear you. All right, I'm hoping that this works this time. <laughs> works great, All right. thank you. So I just Jessica and David for walking us through that content um, and helping us develop a better understanding of the methods the WWC considers acceptable for addressing missing data in group designs, as well as assessing potential bias and baseline equivalence. Um, we do have a couple of questions that we wanted to walk through. Um, we only have about uh, 15 minutes left as part of the webinar, um, so we will jump right in. Um, as participants know, we took questions from you during the registration process and then also questions today that we'll be pulling from. Um, those that we don't get to today though, don't worry, we'll be developing a Q&A document that will be posted with the archived webinar so you'll have access to those responses as well. Um, so the first question I have is how acceptable is multiple imputation in various social science fields? Do journals now expect researchers to use multiple imp imputation? <laughs> sure. So um, kind of a big question here, and I would say that it is beyond the scope of kind of what we're looking at today to really look outside and into what the journal expectations are um, or kind of across the social science field in general. So I will say that from the WWC perspective, um, under the 3.0 standards, only low attrition RCTs could use multiple imputation and meet WWC standards. Um, after these revisions, under the 4.0 standards, multiple imputation can be used in all eligible group designs. Um, and this change is really being done to be consistent with methodological research indicating this method's appropriateness across a wide range of scenarios. As far as the journal specific, I, I would, you know, maybe bring that to your editors, but this is kind of what you can expect and why these changes went into place with the WWC. David, do you have anything to add or are we good to take on another question? No, I think we're yep. ready to take on another. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that, Jessica, and also to remind everyone that we were posting the link to the WWC um, Standards and Procedures Handbook, version 4.0, as well as the review protocols that you can access to learn more about the levels of attrition that are acceptable um, and all of the formulas that were shared here today as well. So here is the next question that we have. Um, so some questions came in advance about software packages that can be used to implement the methods and review procedures discussed today. For instance, one person wanted to know about our packages and another wanted to know about diagnostic tests and STSS. So David or Jessica? Yeah, I'll take that one. That? Great. Yeah, so the missing data methods that were discussed today, such as multiple imputation, can be implemented in most uh, standard statistical software packages. So there is packages in both, um, there is uh, features in both R and SPSS and Stata and SAS to implement multiple imputation. So researchers should feel free to use any software package that they feel most comfortable with. For maximum likelihood, um, it does require, uh, the WWC does require that you use a standard statistical package or accompany the use of that method with appropriate citations to methodological research, but there is a wide range of programs that, that can implement these methods. To diagnose potential bias, researchers can enter in the relevant information, such as means and standard deviations for different samples inside the online SRG. 
which will automatically apply the WWC's review procedures for assessing bias and baseline equivalence under different scenarios. Alternatively, more advanced users can take the formulas in the handbook's appendices B and C, and then code and use them in an environment like R. However, this will require more advanced programming skills and careful examination of the mathematical formulas to make sure that they were copied appropriately. And so if you want to avoid that, the online SRG provides an alternative for users uh, who want to use a more um, simple uh, interface and just simply enter in the relevant information and then have the program run all the different diagnostic tests and assess baseline equivalence under different scenarios. Great. Thank you, David. And also, just so, so participants are aware, so there is a um, online SRG that is used by our certified reviewers, and then we also have a public SRG that is available on the WWC website that you could attempt to try these calculations um, and interface with that, um, if you'd like to have some experience with that before becoming certified um, or to test out some of those formulas that are there as well. Um, the next question is focused on large scale secondary data. It says, if I use a large scale secondary data set, do I have to deal with missing data? Sure, I'll take that one, Sarah. So, um, yes, in any case, um, whether we have primary data or we have secondary data, if there is missing or imputed data, um, you know, we need to address this regardless of where the data is coming from. So, um, something to keep in mind, though, that we often encounter with secondary data sets is that they may often be released with already having put some different imputation procedures in place. And so it's really incumbent upon the analyst to um, review the manuals, the materials that come with that to ensure that this is adhering to the WWC standards that are put forth. Great, thank you. And the final question that we have is that questions came in advance about thresholds for missing data. Um, for instance, one attendee asked, how can we determine if there is too much missing data? Yeah, so I'll take that question. So for the WWC standards, there is no set threat, there's no set percentage of missing data above which or below we would consider the uh, study to be unacceptable versus acceptable. As we discussed, for example, in, in um, step three, where we considered the bias due to imputed outcome data, we were comparing the magnitude of baseline differences for two different samples. You know, the sample that was the complete uh, case sample that had observed baseline and outcome data, and the analytic sample that included participants um, that were analyzed and may have included um, cases with imputed outcome data. So the, and in that case, we require that based on the formula that the potential bias due to imputed outcome data to be less than 0.05 standard deviations, And that in part depends upon those differences in baseline mean. Now, although a specific threshold for an acceptable percentage of missing or imputed data is not used, it is, less likely for those baseline means to be greatly different if there is a small percentage of imputed outcome data. So that's in one way where the sort of idea of, well, if there's more missing data, then the study might, re re the study might, review, might be reviewed lower. That's where that idea comes in, but there is no set threshold for the percentage of missing data in the case of evaluating bias from imputed outcome data, the bias has to be less than 0.05 standard deviation as assessed by the um, formulas and the review procedures that we discussed today. Great, thank you, David. And I wanna say thank you again to both David and Jessica um, for walking us through this complicated topic um, and learning more about that in depth and how we can apply it 
to our the review process as well as when we think about designing our uh, analysis plans and studies in general. So thank you for that. Um, as we come to an end, I just want to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived and available on the WWC website. Um, in addition, we will have the Q&A available for those that want to access it. Um, since we did not get to all of the great questions that were posed today, um, so we'll be providing some resources related to that as well. Um, the other thing I want to remind you about um, is that there is the online group design training that is available to everyone and can be accessed on the WWC website, whether you want to become a certified reviewer or need a refresher course. Um, and some of the details that apply to the version 4.0 standards that shifted from 3.0. Um, we also have a series of webinars that are focused on conducting reviews um, over the next several weeks. Um, the first of which was today with the missing data. Uh, the second of which will occur next week on April 18th and will focus on confounding variables um, in the review process. We also have a third webinar that is focused on how to use the WWC in higher education. Um, for those of you who have students who are considering becoming certified um, or using it as part of your design courses. And then we have a final webinar that is slated for May 8th that is focused on the study context and how we build that into the online SRG and add that to the review process as well. So all of that is up and coming um, and looking forward to seeing you again soon. Um, if you do need any additional information or have questions, um, the final slide does have contact information for both the presenters as well as myself. Um, as well as the WWC Help Desk in which they can answer any questions that you have, whether it be about the certification process, the standards, the procedures, or becoming recertified for version 4.0. So thank you for your time this afternoon, um, and I hope you enjoy yourselves. Take care. <laughs>